So, um, Professor Eric Gervin, thanks so much for joining us. Come on down. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for having me here. Um, I, um, I'm happy to speak um, around this topic. And when I was contacted, I was given some information around your goals and, and what we have for this. So what, what I've decided to do is talk a bit about the topic I have up here, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we'll talk about implicit bias, and we'll talk about other kinds of biases we have, um, and how they can keep us from making the sort of decisions that, that we want to make. As you heard a bit in my background, I have two professional hats. I'm a law professor and I was a practicing attorney. Uh, I also am a social psychologist. And as a bit of background around that, um, social psychology is the part of psychology that's not clinical and counseling like psychology. So it's not what a lot of people think of when they think of psychology or psychiatry. Social psychology is a lot more like sociology. It's a study of human behavior. And the reason, Okay. Sorry to intrude here. Better? Sorry. Okay, thanks. Um, great. So, um, social psychology is a bit more like sociology in the sense that it's, it's a behavioral science. We study how humans behave. And in my work, the kind of behavior that I'm really interested in is discrimination. But I also study how other types of biases basically make conflict occur and make it worse when it occurs. And that's what I do in, my, in the conflict resolution program. So I want to talk a bit about today about these topics then and, and how this relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, when I do this, I'm going to be having, I'm going to have that, that social scientist hat on, not necessarily my legal hat. But if people have questions, there'll be time for questions and discussion. Um, in your if you have legal-related questions, of course, I can you know, try, to, try to talk about them. So to start off on this topic, I guess I have to mention a couple of things. Um, first off, I have some goals for you. And my goals for the session are for you to have an increased understanding of your biases and how the, um, they can help, um, I guess, their biases and the barriers that you have to realizing the benefits of diversity, equity, and inclusion in ourselves and the organizations that we have. Um, which is actually a fairly tall order for less than an hour. So um, we're going to charge in, and as I said, this is maybe a spark or the beginning of a discussion or some things to think about. Um, or as I have it up here, some information and some tools. As I get into this, I need to start or I think it's a good idea to start with this. So this is a version of what a lot of different organizations use, um, referred to as a privilege wheel, or some idea essentially of thinking about how our own experiences and background and demographic characteristics influence our own perspectives, which is, as we'll talk about, in some sense, the root of bias. But one of the things that I think is important about this um, is for me to reflect on the fact that I happen to be um, a white male um, who's heterosexual, I'm married, I was raised in a mainline Protestant Christian church, I have a JD and a PhD, so I'm fairly highly educated, um, I'm a member of a profession that generally regards lots of respect, um, respect to academia, um, I'm in a community that's fairly consistent with my values, right, and has a lot of folks that, that are like me, and all of that shapes my perception. And one of the things that it does is it means I don't experience a lot of discrimination. I don't, right? Um, and so one of the dangers of that is thinking that my experience defines everyone else's experience, which it doesn't, right? And one of the biases that we have, and we'll talk about that, is a tendency to discount how other people's experiences might be different than our own, right? Why? Because it's hard to think of things that you don't experience. It is. And so one of the things I do when I study discrimination is I look at a lot of empirical evidence to find out what might be out there. I don't assume that people are experiencing discrimination necessarily in certain areas, but I do look to literature, do my own empirical studies to try to find it out. So I want to start with just going through a couple of different areas that, that are about discrimination that's, that we have in our society. Um, and to start off with, I have this one. Maybe I can take it off. So this is... This um, chart, and I'll talk about the pieces of it in a second, is the result of a study, one of several actually, that were done by a sociologist 
And her interest, her name was Diva Pager, her interest was in looking at how somebody's race and whether or not they have a criminal record affects their ability to get a job. So what she did was she hired white and black actors and gave them the same qualifications and sent them to apply for actual positions. Right, so the employers had no idea they were in a study at all. They were just hiring people. And what she found is that white applicants with those qualifications got a favorable response as a callback interview or a job offer about a third of the time if they didn't have a criminal record. If you add on a criminal record, in this case it was a two-year sentence for a drug offense, they did about half as well. That's these two bars over here. The first one was African American with those exact same credentials and no criminal record. They did about the same as a white person who did have a criminal record. Right? Um, and it actually didn't matter if they had a criminal record. But in both cases, employers gave them callback interviews or job offers at lower rates than they gave white people who did have a criminal record. Um, looking to some information around um, policing, this came from the Chicago Police Accountability Task Force. Um, they found, looking at the Chicago Police Department's records, that black and Hispanic drivers were searched approximately four times as often as white drivers, yet the Chicago Police Department's own data showed that contraband was found on white drivers twice as often as black and Hispanic drivers. That's a pretty typical finding, actually, for fairly large cities. Um, and, you know, we have a few others, like Los Angeles, um, drivers who are people of color are searched usually about three times as often. Um, in New York City, famously, under broken windows policing, African-American males were searched about seven and a half times as often um, as other groups. And contraband was found on those searches about four to six percent of the time. Right? So 94 percent of the searches turned up nothing. Um, so that's a system. Right, if we move into Oregon, our own Criminal Justice Commission found in 2015 that controlling for estimates of rates of drug use, black Oregonians were more than three and a half times more likely to be, than white Oregonians to be convicted of felony drug use. Right, again, pretty typical across the country. One of the areas that I study a lot and work with is our College of Education on racial disparities in school discipline. Um, we've been studying racial outcomes in schools for since the 1970s or so, collecting data on it. In the 1972-73 school year, African-American students were suspended or expelled for one or more days that about 6% of them had been, where compared to about 3% of white students. Um, that gives us a, what we would call a risk ratio of 2.0, meaning African-American students had twice the risk of being suspended or expelled as white students. Currently, it's close to four times the rate. Right? This is a problem that's gotten much worse over the last 40 years. Right, in terms of racial disparities and discipline. Um, this is Oregon data um, from the 2013-2014 school year. Um, African-American students, we'll just focus on the overalls here for time, um, but breaking it out to um, people who are in special ed versus not, you can tell that special ed students are um, suspended or expelled at much higher rates than, than non-special ed students. But basically the ratios hold that black students in Oregon between two and a half and three times the rate of suspensions or expulsions as white students, um, Native American students about two times the rate. Right, so that's the current system, what's going on in our schools now. I'm look at gender disparities, um, in particularly in leadership positions. So these are the faces or portraits of women who, at least at the beginning of 2018, were chief executive officers of Fortune 500 companies. Um, so you think about 500 large, largest companies or thereabouts in the country, there are 500 of them, obviously. These are the only ones, women, who are chief executive officers. Right. For comparison, these are the portraits of the chief executive officers of those companies named John. Um, if we look at a larger group like the S&P 1500, it turns out that there are more CEOs named either John or David than women at all of those companies. Right? And so we think about that in terms of who's running them, what perspectives are there, right? and, and what ends up happening. Of course, we could talk a lot about the reasons behind this. 
And a lot of them are structural, there's historical, there's institutional, um, there's different rates of pr preferences for particular positions and other things like that. And if I was here from a history department or an anthropology department or a sociology department or others, right, economics, we could talk a lot about them because these kinds of differences are studied by a lot of different social scientists. Um, but I'm here from a psychological background, so we're gonna focus on a, a subset of those reasons that have to do with, with these kind of biases. Um, in particular, the fact is, that we all have biases, and we all use shortcuts, or what are sometimes called heuristics, to understand the world. I wanna start off by being pretty clear, because when we talk about biases generally, or implicit bias in particular, when we use the word bias, it's not intended to be the same thing as what we might think of as prejudice. So prejudice is, is motivated, right? It's, we think about it as sort of a hatred, right, for some group, or even or an irrational like for a group, right? It could be either way. Um, but, it's, but it has a motivational component. Bias, as this is used traditionally in, in kind of implicit bias or other research, is um, more in the statistical sense of people making systematic mistakes. Right? Um, so I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, and it's based on a stereotype that people might have that's true, right, in the aggregate. And that stereotype would be that men are faster than women. My office is right across the street from Hayward Field, so we could look at data on that and look at it. It is true overall that men are faster than women. Right, that's true. But it's not true that every man is faster than every woman. Right, that's not true. And so if you apply that group average to make decisions, so for example, if you were to have a man and a woman who were supposed to race and you were supposed to bet on one of them, Right? Most people would rationally pick the man because they're faster, if that's all you know. But we also know what you should do right, is find out what their foot speed is because that's the actual relevant piece of information. So I've done, because I use this example sometimes, I've done a little bit of research on it by downloading things like the results of turkey trots around the country. Some of you may participate in those and actually compare the rates of them um, between them. And it turns out that if you were to make that bet, right, based on them. If you take a random man and a random woman from these, and you were to make that bet, and you pick the man, and, and you said the man's gonna be faster, you would be right 65% of the time, on average. Keeping in mind that 50-50 is a coin flip, that would be if neither group was faster, right? So that's what it gets you is that extra 15%. And you keep in mind that if you make that decision, then you're gonna be wrong 35% of the time. And not only are you gonna be wrong 35% of the time, every time you're wrong, it's gonna to be to the disadvantage of a woman. And that's what we mean by bias, right? You're not randomly wrong. You're wrong in a way that's a disadvantage to women. And not only, if you think about it, are you gonna be wrong in a way that disadvantages women, you're gonna be wrong particularly in a way that disadvantages women who have spent a lot of time working to try to be fast. And who are you gonna preference? You're gonna preference men who sit on the couch and eat potato chips all the time. Every time you make a mistake, that's what you're gonna be doing. So when we talk about bias, it's not the prejudice piece, it's the fact that you're not randomly wrong. You're wrong in a way that systematically ends up favoring one group in a particular situation and others. So that's what we think about bias. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so then also we have shortcuts and heuristics. These are just ways that we kind of use to interpret the world, and we have to because the world is really complicated. Right, these biases, these heuristics, these shortcuts that our brains use are necessary. We actually can't get through the day without them because the world is way too complicated to take individually. So let's just talk about a few of them. Um, before I do that, I wanna get, go into a quick exercise to sort of show you how these work. And so I'd like you to look at this image. Let's take a second and look at it. Um, and I wanna know by show of hands, yes, this is participatory. Okay, here we go. Um, so I wanna know by show of hands, how many people would say that this square up here, which is marked with an A, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, is darker in color, so it looks darker in color to you than this square marked with B? Go ahead and raise your hand. This should be pretty easy, by the way. I don't start with hard ones. <laughs> okay, how many people say that this B square looks darker in color to them than the A square? And how many people say they look the same? Okay. Um, so it turns out they are exactly the same color. And I don't mean that the A in there or the B in there are the same color. I mean the squares are actually exactly the same color. And the reason that you don't see them as the same color is because you don't actually see the world the way it is. You don't. None of us do. Right? You see the world in a way that's limited by the limits of your senses right? and the inferences your brain makes and what that tells you about how to interpret it. 
and the judgments and decisions you make after that. This is an optical illusion called the checkerboard illusion that exploits one of those shortcuts or heuristics that your brain uses when it's trying to guess what color things are. And one of the things it does is it looks to the adjacent square. So these squares here, adjacent to the sides of the A square, are relatively lighter than it. And these squares adjacent to the B square are relatively darker than it. And because of that, your brain uses that information to adjust to make an estimate of what it thinks the actual square is. But in this case, the estimate is wrong. Right? It's designed that way. So how many people believe me that they're actually the same color? <laughs> We've got a couple of polite people, right? I could spend a little more time talking about the PhD piece, whatever. No, that's fine, right? It's good. It's actually good to be critical thinkers. Um, and I don't expect you to take my word for it, so I'm going to show you. So that yellow circle is my cursor. I'm just going to select the A square or part of it and some of the adjacent squares so you don't accuse me of cheating. Cut it out and drag it down so you can see that they're the same color, right? Because they are the same color. Still the same color. And if you don't like that version, I can show you this version, right? Both the squares are the same color as that gray bar, so I can just move the gray bar over, right? They are exactly the same color. The takeaway point here, and why this is important for thinking about bias, biases that we might have that are unintended, right, is that if you were to make square, a decision about this square and this square, right, and treat them differently, you would actually be discriminating. Right? Because they're actually the same even if you don't see them that way. Right? That's the way it works. Um, and we can think about a different way to think about this too. Because if you're looking at this image, um, and I ask you that question about which square is darker and which one's not, right? or how to, to compare the colors of them, there's only two pieces of information on this slide that are actually relevant to that, which are those squares themselves. The context that they come in is actually not relevant. Um, and so I can remove that context, and it turns out it's really easy, right? It's very often irrelevant contextual features, right, from the immediate circumstance or from our experience that color the way that we see things in a way that can lead to biased judgments. Right? And so when people talk about implicit bias, that's what they're talking about essentially is a way that our background experiences, what we've learned, how we've learned to categorize the world, can automatically affect the way we see it and make judgments about it, largely outside of our conscious awareness. And it can keep us from behaving in ways that are consistent with our values. It doesn't matter how much you value equal opportunity, equity, right, inclusion, any of those things, that value doesn't insulate you from your, against your brain doing this. Right? It doesn't. Um, and that's what makes some other things important, which is unless we take steps to try to address it, it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. Um, and just, of course, taking steps to address it um, is no guarantee. This is kind of a long process. So that's one set of biases that we might have, right? The way that we might bring that into it. Um, there are some others um, that are related to this. So I mentioned earlier that we automatically categorize the world, right? That's part of the way that our brain uses to get through it. Um, so I just want to illustrate that quickly um, because I want to show you how, how easy it is for us to do this. So I'm just going to press my button here, and an image of some things are going to pop up. I want you to yell out what it is you see. All right, now I recognize I just showed you an optical illusion, so my credibility might be a little <laughs> shot. But, um, but just go for it, right? Because you won't be wrong. So what are these? Good job, they're chairs, right? And upon closer inspection, you might find that you have never in your life seen a chair that looks exactly like any of those before, and that they actually look quite differently from one another. But it's still trivially easy for your brain to categorize them as chairs. We do this all the time, right? So what our brains are built to do is to categorize things that are actually kind of different from one another into buckets. And it's good because we can walk into a room, see a chair-like thing, and know how to use it, right? Millions of times a day, that's how we do things. If we had to stop and actually 
process and define every individual thing we saw, we couldn't do anything. But doing this, of course, has consequences because it makes us then treat all of these different things as if they're the same, even though they might not be. Okay, I've got another one. What are these? Dogs, good, right, this is great. Again, another one that might be really useful, right? In fact, if you were in, I have two kids, my son is in seventh grade now and my daughter's in fourth grade. You know, when they were younger, we'd go hiking, they'd meet dogs. I'd tell them, if you wanna pet them, because they often would, you need to ask the owner, approach it with your hand out, be careful it might bite, right? A set of rules that don't matter if it has long hair or short hair, right, or anything like that. And, and if they were in kindergarten and they couldn't tell the difference ultimately between a dog and say a cow, we would actually start to worry, right? They would be assigned to somewhere to receive special support because it's important for our brains to be able to categorize things. And it still means it'll make us a tendency to treat dogs, all dogs alike, right? When we're not reflecting on it under certain circumstances. And it might be that they're not. Um, another shortcut that we use, and I mentioned shortcuts are called heuristics that can come into play here, is that when we're asked to think about how probable something is, which often comes up in public policy. I know this is League of Women's Voters, so it, the politics, right? Um, when it comes up with policy decisions, often the things that we think we should worry about, right, are things that we think are frequent or really problematic. Well, it turns out that the way that our brains try to tell us how likely something is, is how quickly we can think of an example of it. It turns out this is a terrible way to figure out whether something's likely or not. Why? Because it's dependent entirely on your individual experience, right? So if it's not something you experience or haven't experienced in a way, it won't come to mind for you. And so that will color whether you think it's a priority or not. The other thing is we have things like the media, right? Which will play an enormous role in putting things in front of our attention. It's why people tend to be worried more about plane crashes than car accidents. Because when, every time a plane crashes, the news covers it for three weeks. <laughs> so if I ask you, can you think of a plane crash, it's pretty easy to think of an example of one. Not because they happen a lot, but because it's been put in front of your attention. Right? In fact, there are people who study this kind of heuristic and they say, if it's in the newspaper, by definition, you shouldn't worry about it. Because if it was more frequent, it wouldn't be news. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Right? This is the way it works. So I want to take one example of this just from, from our ideas and how this can color our perceptions and our experiences of things. And so this has to do with um, gun violence, right, or gun deaths. Comes up public policy debates and discussions. So this is a chart. This was made by um, some statisticians at 538. That one little dot over there, which you can probably barely see, on this grid is one gun death in the United States. So this is all the gun deaths, right, that happen in a year. And if we think about gun deaths and we think about gun policy and what we prioritize, um, it often goes to this. That blue line there, right, those are all the gun deaths that come from terrorism, mass shootings, or are related to police, right, Other, either by officers or of officers. That line dominates our public policy discussion and our thinking about what we think about guns. That is suicides. Um, and then the remainder on the side, of course, is violent crime and other and accidents and other instances. But the vast majority of gun deaths are actually related to suicides. And that, we would think, is disproportionately not covered, usually, in the news. And so when we think about gun deaths, right, it's not usually the first thing that comes to mind. It's that little blue bar. Right? And that can affect where we put public policy attention and how we think about it about what our experiences are based on our biases. Um, another one, right, I'm going into politics here because this is it, um, is about the election, right, the 2006 election. And one area where people tend to have lots of biases and use these heuristics comes with partisanship. Right, I think if you happen to identify strongly with um, a person, uh, one political party or another, right, I imagine that it's really easy for you when you see a bumper sticker that identifies somebody as a member of the other party to make all kinds of assumptions about what that person is like, <laughs> right? Those are biases. Those are things you've filled in, right? You have just said men are faster than women, right? 
and treated that person that way. Um, we fill in that information, right? But there's actually a lot of variation. So we can do this too when we think about like who would have done that kinds of stories around the election. So let's break it down. Right? We think about the election. Each of these squares is one million people. So there are about 324 million people in the country. One square equals one million people. This yellow section here are people who can't vote. Right? Essentially, children, non-citizens, and felons, that up corner. So those are people who cannot vote. So we take those out if we're talking about the US citizenship, citizens. Um, this is the primary election. This little group of people here picked our president for the Republican Party, and this little group of people here picked Clinton, right, to be the representative for the Democratic Party. These other people can't vote, didn't vote um, at all, didn't vote in the primaries, and people who voted for other primary candidates were not involved in selecting those people, right, of all the country. Um, how about if we break it down into the actual election then? Um, this segment, about 20% of the people, voted for Hillary Clinton. This one, um, slightly lower percentage, um, but also rounds to 20%, voted for our current president. These other groups here, right, the other 60% of the population didn't vote for either of them. Right, so when we're talking about a particular group of people, we're talking about who might have selected whomever or what they are, we're really talking about these 20% slices. Right, not everybody. But we tend to lose sight of that. Right, about who selected whatever and that the majority of people didn't actually select either. Um, you can do the same thing with the composition of political parties. Right, when you break it down to demographic groups, we might have biases or automatic assumptions about what kind of people are members of either political party. So the middle example here, this middle one, I know you probably can't read them where you are, um, is Pew Research laying out partisan um, political parties by education, right? And you might have some assumptions that you have about members of which political party are more educated or not. And if you look at that, um, this would be all voters, and then you look at people who lean Republican versus people who lean Democrat um, or are Democrat, and what you see is 30 and a small amount of change of them have a high school education or less in both parties. 30 and some change of them have some college. And 30 and some change of them have college degrees. There aren't actually big differences, right, in education levels. And so when you hear, when we talk about education levels, you're talking about actually marginal percentage differences is what gets emphasized in discussions around these things. Um, you can think about that in terms of age, too, right, ideas about it. There just aren't tremendously large differences. Not that you can't find small percentage differences, but there aren't actually tremendous differences in them. And it's those small differences that sometimes get fixated on to produce ideas of larger differences. Um, so thinking about these biases that we have from our experience and how they color what we pay attention to and what we think is important and how we um, emphasize or think about the, what, what other people are like. Basically, it comes down to these categories, right? We use these categories and mental shortcuts based on our experience and learning to simplify the complex world. As a result of doing that, we tend to overemphasize perceived similarities within our categories. We think people that are, belong to groups that we're members of are more alike than they actually are. Right? And we tend to overemphasize the extent of differences between groups, right? The, member, the differences between groups are typically much smaller than we imagine. Right? Because that's what categorization does. Right? It makes us think everything in the two groups are the same when they're not really. Really, like the runners, males and females, there's a tremendous amount of overlap. It also leads us to be overconfident in the accuracy of our own judgments, right? our perceptions and our beliefs. Because we think reality, we think our experience reflects reality, not a distorted, biased subsample of reality. Um, and that leads us to underappreciate the experiences of others and attributes we lack. Why? Because they're not part of our experience, so we can't take them into account easily. Right? When our brain is organizing information, it doesn't take them into account. So what does that mean? That means that it often can be really good and helpful, not only to actually look at data as opposed to making assumptions about how these different things are, but to expose ourselves to different perspectives. Right, to think about the, the difference um, within our groups and the similarities across groups because it's only through exposure to people from those groups that we actually learn about those. Right? We learn about what's the same and what's different. 
And this can actually be really beneficial for a number of reasons, our own learning, for example, but also for our organizations. So this is a set of studies that were done around businesses. Um, and it turns out that companies that have more diverse leadership, executive boards, earn actually a lot more returns on their equity than other ones, right? Why? Oftentimes they're just much better problem solvers because they get closer to a view of the world as it actually is, as opposed to a biased view from a particular subset of experiences, right, by having that exposure. So when we think about that, we wanna think about then what makes something diverse or different and we can think about that, we can define there's a lot of writing on this, but components of diversity. Often the things we think about when we think about diversity are demographic characteristics, right? Age, gender, race, color, um, abled versus disabled, appearance, those sorts of things. Or cultural, right? Ethnic, um, national origin, um, could be sexual or orientation, um, different lifestyles, family styles, choices, religion, et cetera, or socioeconomic, it could be education, job function, social class, income, those kinds of characteristics. When we think about diversity and we're thinking about challenging ourselves to look at difference, right, and find the areas that we don't have, we also can think about other things like diverse perspectives, right, different ways of thinking about situations and problems. Um, some people, for example, like to think out loud or respond quickly. Other people like to sit and think about something and process information on their own. Right? and take some time to do it and find connections. Um, this one here is diverse interpretations. People put things into different categories based on their experiences. We all categorize, we have to, right? Our brain is built to categorize. But the categories that we use differ based on our education, our upbringing, our culture, right, and our background. And so other people might not think of a situation in the same way or put it in the same category that you do. And it can be helpful to think about those different categories. In fact, one of the reasons that I really love academic collaboration is working with people in other disciplines. Because we'll take the same situation and we'll categorize it in completely different ways. And if I can learn from them how they do it, it opens my eyes to different ways of thinking about it that might then be useful for what, what I do, right? That kind of improved problem solving. Um, diverse heuristics, I talk about those people have different shortcuts. Some people like to, this was talking through thinking, some people like to write out solutions, different predictive models. Some people like to do logical analysis of problems. Other people like to think how they fit into a narrative, for example, right? And all of that can be valuable in challenging us to think differently about, about issues. So I'd like you to do at your table, take a couple minutes, think about time, um, and see if you can think about diversity in yourself, right? And diversity in the, those around you. How are your colleagues or the folks at your table like you? And how are they different? And there will be a tendency to go with the demographic characteristics, but I want you to dive a little bit deeper and start thinking about how you might be different or the same from one another in your thinking styles and your approach and those sorts of things. It's important to know where you're the same and where you're different. So we'll take two or three minutes and do that and then we'll come back. Let's so go ahead. Okay, if I get your attention. By the way, my hope for all of this is to start these conversations and not stop them, <laughs> right? So my hope is you'll actually take these and keep talking about what we talked about here today. Um, but I also want to be respectful of your time and know that we have an hour and have a little bit more to get to here. Um, so if we're thinking about our similarities and differences and how when we're the same, that can feel a lot more comfortable, which is why we often sort ourselves that way. And it risks leaving out information, right, or facilitating or exacerbating our biases. It's the extent that we all have similarities, right, similar education, similar belief systems, similar other things, it means that we'll tend to have similar ways of thinking about the world and not be exposed to alternatives. And difference, of course, then can help us with that, right, embracing it, but the flip side is it can be less comfortable. So um, that brings me to this point, right? That, that realizing the benefits of diversity requires that people with different experiences and perspectives are welcomed, right? And have the ability to actually effectively participate in our organizations or social lives, 
otherwise, right, if we just have somebody who's different around but we never let them speak or when, we speak, when they speak, right, we always dismiss what they say, right, then we're not actually learning from them or gaining anything by that perspective. So that's the equity and inclusion part on our biases, is it re does require that there be that kind of inclusive piece. And that can be hard, right? As much as we might value equal opportunity, as much as we might say we value diverse perspectives and other things, um, in practice, it can be pretty challenging to, to realize those benefits of diversity. And there's two things that I wanna talk about that, become, that can become barriers or threats to realizing that. The first one is something called naive realism, which is a psychological theory, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the other is that conflict piece. Right, so we'll talk about each of those in, in, together. Um, naive realism is a psychological theory that basically outlines our subjective experience when we find that we disagree with somebody about something we care about. Right? So I want you to say as we go through this, it'll be kind of first person, you, I want you to kind of think through yourself to yourself, is this true for you? Right? Okay, so here's the basic idea. That we all tend to believe that we see the world the things that are in the world, facts, issues, events, as they actually are in reality, right? That's our working assumption. So we also assume that other rational actors will generally share our judgments and reactions, assuming they have the same information that we do, right? The same inferences and experiences. So other rational people will have the same views. So what happens if we meet somebody who doesn't have our same views? couple of things, right? First thing first, actually, we might give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's just because they have less knowledge or information than I do. <laughs> right? That's it. Right? That's what it is. And so what do you do? Well, you try to inform them, right? <laughs> Send them that information. <laughs> and when that doesn't work, right, after you've shared information with them, when that doesn't work, then you make the assumption that they're biased, duplicitous, stupid, right? Something is defective about them. They, aren't, they don't fit a rational actor because if you have access to the truth and they don't acknowledge that, right, then they must have something wrong with them. And that gives you permission to basically delegitimize and disregard them, right? Because they must not be rational. So that's the idea of naive realism. It describes how this plays out internally. The problem is, is that we're all biased. And so this, what this ignores, or leads us to, is systematically discount the extent to which our disagreement with others is attributable to our own biases, our own limited experience, and our own lack of knowledge. If we think about it, right, and we're this green dot over here, if reality is the blue dot, and we run to somebody who has an orange dot, right? And the orange dot and the green dot, we'll call them the Oregon Ducks fan and the Oregon State Beavers fan, are talking with each other, right? The Ducks fan's going to think that the Beavers fan is a lot more biased than they actually are because they're looking from their own perspective, not the perspective of the truth, right? And the same thing's gonna happen the other way. There's a lot of research on this actually in what's called the hostile media effect. That if you do a empirically neutral news story on an event, people who are partisan will view it as biased. Why? Because they'll be viewing it from their position, not from the middle. So if you're looking that way, you'll say it's biased towards them and the other side will say it's biased towards you. And in some ways you can rate that that way, right? You can see, uh, that it works out that way. So, so that's the problem, I guess, of naive realism. Um, and a problem of exposing yourself to diverse perspectives, but not realizing right, that fundamentally, if you're going to take that exercise seriously, it's admitting that you don't have privileged access to the truth. Right? You have to be admitting to take that seriously of having diverse perspectives that you don't know it all, which is moving you off of that first part of naive realism, right? That you see things the way they are. Um, so what I'd like you to do at your table is a second exercise to see if you can think of a time when you've engaged in naive realism, right? When basically when you have talked with somebody and found that you've disagreed about something you care about. 
does naive realism describe the way that you went, right? The way that you went through that thinking like, oh, I just need to tell them a little bit more information and that will change their mind. And then when it didn't, anchoring on your own position, you said, well, there must be something wrong with them, right? That idea? Go ahead and take a minute. So in my experience, most people can reflect and find out the, an example fairly easily of this occurring. And right, thinking about how that might be inconsistent with values that we have of actually learning from one another and thinking about the benefits of diversity or trying to make you know, um, decisions that are, that are unbiased. Um, and so that brings us to this second part, right? Because naive realism creates and exacerbates conflict it itself, that perspective. So what could we do given that we have biases? Um, and again, I mean that by we have the limitations of our own perspectives and experiences, right? And the way that we are prone to categorizing and viewing things. Things we can do to try to get past that, to help ourselves um, get past that, are, can happen at a couple of different levels. The first one is institutional, I think about it, is that we can create inclusive and transparent processes. In fact, we know from a lot of research that awareness that we have biases actually doesn't help very much. We need to actually change the way we go about structuring our decisions and our interactions to get past it. And so we'll talk about that. And the second one is communication skills. Because if you welcome diversity, you will have disagreement. That's the hope at some level. And so figuring out how to work constructively through that so that everyone can benefit from the differences in perspectives. So that first thing, to inclusive transparent processes. Um, this can, these can be at lots of different levels. Um, one of the ways that I like to think about it in terms of what your goal should be is something that um, researchers at the intersection of psychology and law call procedural justice. And this refers to the perceptions of people who are involved in an organization or an institution or a decision-making process, um, the perception that it was a fair process, right? And it comes out of actually criminal justice work. And I'll give you the basic background. It was designed by a guy named Tom Tyler, um, who's now at Yale Law School, was at NYU. And this is what he was studying, was he knows that if you are arrested for a crime and tried and convicted of that crime, the day that you're sentenced, that's a bad day, right? It is a bad day. But it's a different kind of bad day if you think that the whole system was actually stacked against you and you never had a fair chance to have a, your case heard than it is if you acknowledge that the, that the process actually gave you a chance and it was legitimate. In fact, that difference can make a big difference in terms of how people internalize the fact that they engaged in criminal activity, whether they ultimately recidivate again. Right? Because if you feel like you were just railroaded into a particular position and never had a chance to say anything, it's the system that did something, not you. And you're unlikely to change your behavior. If you understand that you actually had a fair process as a result of it, you might think more about how you might change. So the ideas of um, procedural justice boil down to a set of what you think about as measures or kind of questions that you could ask yourself about whether your processes meet these. Um, so are people, from diverse perspectives, able to express their views during those procedures? Can they influence the decisions arrived at by those procedures? Are the procedures applied consistently? Are the procedures free of bias? Are the procedures based on accurate information? Are you able to appeal a decision if that process occurred? Are the procedures um, consistent with ethical and moral standards? And the idea would be to have somebody, even somebody who lost right, in a policy position, to look at these questions and say, yeah, all of those were actually true of this process. I might not have gotten the outcome I liked here, but this was true of the process. Right? That's what we're, we're trying for. And so what that can be in terms of an organization or our lives is it can have things potentially amount to having some kinds of supportive structures, which can reflect differences in meeting times and locations. We know a lot of this from education, working out, having them at times that are when fewer parents are likely to be working. Provide childcare, right? 
um, or address or find out the needs of groups that you're hoping to have be included in those organizations, right? Reach out to them and find out what's important or what are the barriers to keeping them and work seriously to try to overcome those more structural or institutional barriers to their being heard. And that's how we get people there and have them be included. Once people are there and providing these kinds of perspectives, the other thing that we can do is work on ourselves on active listening, right, in communication style. And active listening effectively um, is sort of a fancy term, or I guess a term of art in conflict resolution um, for an approach that I think of just as a learning approach, right? When you're talking to somebody, you're not, while they're talking, preparing your counter argument. That is not active listening, <laughs> right? What active listening is, is switching your orientation to actively trying to learn what it is they're saying, right? And where they're coming from. Not making assumptions, not getting ahead of it, but it means acknowledging what they say. This is one framework for it, right? Acknowledging what they say, asking clarifying questions, but not loaded clarifying questions, right? Ones that are genuinely interested <laughs> in them, empathize from where they're coming from, and at the end, summarizing what they say. Sometimes you hear this stylized. At the end of an active, if you're engaged in active listening, at the end you should be able to say, so what I hear you saying is, and provide them a summary, and have them say, yes, that's it. And if they don't say, yes, that's it, then you should be asking more questions, right, and finding out, because the onus is on you, an active listening, right? You need to be trying to find out that information. And once you have that, that doesn't mean that necessarily people will change their minds, right? but it does mean that you'll actually learn and have the opportunity to be exposed to their different perspectives, their different experiences, and understand and how that might come into play. Um, I guess I had one last example I have time, and then I'll open it up for a few minutes of questions. Um, and that last example that I wanted to raise is, is a man named Daryl Davis. I don't know, some of you may have heard of him. He's a jazz musician. Um, he's an African-American male, and he has a kind of an interesting hobby and his hobby is befriending people who are members of the Ku Klux Klan. Yep. Um, there is a couple of documentaries about him and some covering on them, but over the course of several years of doing this, um, he's had about 200 members of the Klan leave the Klan and send him their ropes. And the way he does it is not by yelling at them, right? He sits down with them and has meals with them. Um, and in many cases, he's the first African-American male they've actually sat down and talked to, right? And you find out in those situations that those stylized differences, the categories we put each other in and how they magnify the differences, that the real differences are not actually as large, right? And that both of them care about potholes and both of them care about safety for their kids and both of them care about, right, there are a lot of areas of overlap. And it's through those discussions and not avoiding race issues when they come up, his sort of preparation to talk about them in a no-nonsense way and say things like, remember one of the um, anecdotes that's rec recounted, was one of the men who said, sat down and said, you know, told him, you're African-American, so you're a criminal. He said, I'm not a criminal, I've never been arrested. He said, well, it's latent, it just hasn't come out yet, that was the <laughs> argument. And so he told the guy, he said, well, you know, you're a serial killer. He says, what are you talking about? He's like, every serial killer I've ever seen is a white male. So I have never killed anybody. Well, it's just latent, right? And the guy said, that's absurd. Of course, of course it's absurd, but it helps like, realize the absurdity of that generalization, right? But just through those conversations along with the realizing the common space, ultimately has gotten people to widen their perspective, right? And understand those differences. Um, and so thinking about that in terms of that active listening and that relationship piece, that that can be a powerful way for us to think about where people are coming from and what perspectives they have um, and how that might help us fill in the gaps in our own experiences and challenge the ways that we tend to categorize and simplify the world in a way that leads to biased decision making. So thank you. So Ke Kelly has the walk around mic. So if you have questions, we have time just for a, f for a few. If there are any, maybe everybody's been worked out. Okay, there's one. <laughs> Fine. 
Could you elaborate a little bit more on the, uh, that huge statistics of uh, suicide, gun suicide, um, some specifics of the gun, use of guns in suicide, yes, or sure. whatever. I yeah, like I can it. elaborate on it. So yeah, about two-thirds-ish, I mean, give or take, of gun deaths are actually suicides. Right? Um, and so that leads us, if, I'll, I'll frame it in the way that I talked about it, because when we talk about gun violence, we often imagine that it's terrorism or right, um, these mass shootings that get covered a lot in the news. And in turn, that's actually a really tiny sliver of overall gun deaths. But if that's what we're thinking about, that means that we tend to advocate for or have debates about different kinds of policies than we do if we realize that most of the gun deaths are suicides. And so then we can start studying things like, for example, um, people might make a hypothesis that if someone's going to commit suicide um, and they don't have a gun available, they'll just find something else. Um, it turns out there's lots of public health research on that, and it's not true. Right? Most suicides are fleeting instances, and because guns are extremely lethal, it's easy access to them that facilitates it. And they're also mostly one-time things. People who attempt suicide and aren't successful mostly don't commit suicide or try to commit suicide again. And so that leads you to do things like to talk about separating ammunition from guns, off-site storage, gun locks, those sorts of things, which also would help with accidents, right? even if they might not help with the acquisition of large arsenals for the purposes of a mass shooting. But it's framing the problem in terms of those areas that help us think about what might be the right or wrong solutions. Is that, is that helpful? Oh, there are a couple more, I don't know. Maybe. At our table, one of the things that we talked about differences was uh, brother, sister will not talk about politics. Yes. And several people did that. I'm wondering if sometimes you agree that relationships are more important than your differences. Yes. Because uh, they won't discuss politics, they'll discuss other things. Sure. Um, there is no universal recommendation, right? And discussion of things that people disagree about is always has some risk, right? And the rewards, I guess, is that learning or connection. Um, so I'll, Put it in terms of a, a dispute resolution model. We often talk about when people are in disputes. Um, what's, what often happens is they're at odds with respect to their positions, right? They're sort of recommendations of what ought to be done. But that doesn't mean that their underlying interests aren't aligned in some way. So a lot of conflict res resolution professionally is trying to move people off of their positions. This is the thing we must do or the thing we must not do and get them to start thinking about what the underlying interests that they have are, right? There might be a lot of people who disagree with you, right, and have advanced positions that you, are strong, you find strongly objectionable, and the underlying interest might be a sense of anxiety or insecurity or suffering or other things that's completely relatable. And so doing that level shifting, figuring out how to move to a place of commonality and interests, um, is something that can happen in even really awful conflict. And so, and it is a chance for growth, right, and understanding. Um, it also takes work, right, and commitment. And so it's not always, you know, easy to do. I was, I've been surprised this last summer a couple of times, just like standing in line at a place and have somebody like throw out, a, I thought, a fairly um, gutsy move, just like advancing a topic in conversation, like in the grocery store. I was like, wow, that's like, that was not the weather. <laughs> um, and it's fine, I can handle it, but it's like, okay, that's, you know, um, it's a way to do it. So we often have norms about that because it can take time and a commitment to want to have those conversations and get at a deeper level. And maybe some understanding by people that that's what you, you need to be trying to do as opposed to, we need to do it, we don't need to do it. We need to do it, we don't need to do it, right? Yes. I don't keep time, so. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful presentation. I thought um, you might be interested uh, in, uh, I just moved here from Washington, D.C. area. <laughs> Lived uh, back east, Washington, D.C., Alexandria, most of my adult life. Um, it's much more diversified back there. Mm -hmm. And that was my 
experience. Um, I moved here to Eugene and we're mostly white. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always interested when I see a black person, Hispanic, Asian, and you know, I, I, I look for the diversity. And I know it's here, um, just maybe not as evident. Yesterday, and I have to laugh, yesterday I attended another meeting and there were about 20 of us and we were all white women except for one. There was, she appeared to me to be African American and I said, good, you know, this is, you know, it's uh, always nice as I say, I look, I'm looking for diversity. So when she went to introduce herself, she actually was born in Mexico City. And uh, I had made an assumption that she was African American. So yeah, I had to laugh at myself when I said, oh, <laughs> I was wrong there. But uh, anyways, yeah. it's, it's been an interesting experience going, coming from the East Coast here to the West, or yeah. to Eugene. Yeah, it's very different. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, one last token. Um, I was curious to know a little bit more about the procedural justice, is that what it's yes. called? And can like that, that can be an avenue to overturn um, a case? I'm just curious about that. Um, no, it's not a legal grounds for it. It's, I, I would consider it more to be um, best practices, that there are a lot of courts. So the National Center for State Courts, for example, advocates for and provides policies and recommended things for court systems to do to help increase procedural justice. Um, because without it, um, you know, the justice part is just a label in some sense. Um, it's important to be able to have people actually authentically be heard in those situations. Um, I'll, let's say the, the countervailing piece, the extent that's in there is, it's not efficient. <laughs> and so when we have, I mean, I think Lane County, I'm trying to remember the last time we checked or something. Um, so child dependency, initial child dependency hearings, these are the hearings where somebody might be taking somebody's kids away from them, probably one of the worst things the legal system can do or the hardest things for a parent can do. Um, I think those hearings on average last seven minutes um, or something, right? And part of it is just case volume, right? And part of it is, you know, some of them last longer if they're particularly consistent or there's more information. Sometimes the parents aren't there and it's absentee. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of things that play into it. But that's different than other places in the, in, in the country and in, in Oregon where they're closer to four.